unpopular Xerxes the first is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian and it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian so Xerxes the Great as he was known earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia as well as in Egypt people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and by extension the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number 9 is a famous hussy, Ramses the second. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure 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 sure, he was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous blah blah. He's the son of Seti the first and Ramesses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90 which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying two faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the great before it was cool. All in all he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number 8 is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to show also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number 7. Surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52 year old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheets, it's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it, the baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying, it's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley 
crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. Number five, space knife. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites and Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin. A blade fell from the sky, and now a king has it. That's pretty insane. Also, aliens? Just saying. Number four, KB-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary. That's definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out, whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite, so that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed, so we have really no idea who's in KB-55, or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, when in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked in seven two. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just, just write it down, please. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past. That's fine. Just be sad with eyebrows. Be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected, and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible. It's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers. A hippo! And then ended the pharaoh's life. Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer. They won't 
stop you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike, <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair if the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the, you know, 200 wives. Otherwise, ow and how, if it was just one person. Ow and how, you know? It's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint. Just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas, let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living and after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, AKA an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they t tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just started stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number six is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had six years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pill with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genitals, 
Ilya the Pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers. But the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars lore left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in serious engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number 4 is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crown, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serfs strip naked, cover themselves in honey and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number 3 is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a klepto maniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff, put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he had been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed and had them punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora. Literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rinacola, or Rincolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actus Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Ak did everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten, and then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they are working and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national socionomic and cultural hubs. It was the gods priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest 
recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. Starting off our list at number 10, the first peace treaty. Unusual at the time? Absolutely. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. At this point in history, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was finally underway. Tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight, what's left to do now at this point? Ramses II and King Hattusili III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found right now in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official. Our man Guinness confirms it. Boom. That's how you know. Moving on. Number 9. Game Night. I love board games and honestly that includes Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then, you know? Pass and go, I'm like, okay, I'll pay the tax. I'm respecting this game so far. But ancient Egyptians, turns out they also loved board games. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen, Senate, and 20 Squares. Those are some popular games. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC, and the goal here was to reach the center of the spiral. The board was a coiled snake almost. Senate was the most popular game. Kings and queens alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Of course, the rules are still unknown, heavily debated, just like Monopoly today. I'm like, is it 200 or 100? Are we sure? But now we have some ideas how Egyptians played Senate. There were three rows of 10 squares, the last five were always decorated. Now it's assumed this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus King Tut was buried with one of these boards, so that's definitely something to do with it. And there's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so you know it was addictive. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms are already so sweaty. Number eight, glamour. Makeup in ancient Egyptian culture was key. Not only did they wear makeup and smell good because they wanted to resemble the very gods they believed in, but makeup had a practical use as well in the daily life of a pharaoh. They believed makeup gave you protection from the gods Ra and Horus. They would put together these beauty kits by grinding down malachite and galena, and then they would create the substance called coal. There wasn't a lot of blending back then. Makeup was often applied directly to the skin using wood or bone. And it wasn't just the ladies as well. Men wore makeup and perfume. Of course, you gotta look good and smell good. Be like, have you seen them? What? I, I wanna wear some of this. They smell like beautifulness. They smell like the afterlife. They smell amazing. Egyptians believed makeup had healing abilities, and honestly, they weren't wrong. Makeup back then had enough lead in them, so eye infections would stay away, ideally. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world, that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshiping. So if you're a fan of bulls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass. 
and also terrifying. That's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Today at Saqqara, there's a massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times. Like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three, we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them. I risk everything just to... Yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it. They're cute. They respected them. They worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat would just be like... No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good? Hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack. Make him jacked. I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan. I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God. Gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days. But nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them. And then, however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. Just gonna pee on your crops, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it. You guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party apparently. If their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo on one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here, I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. 
One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like, thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last. And clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. Number 10 is getting lit. Whether their decisions were in regards to themselves, their offspring, their futures, their laws, or their people, pharaohs weren't always known for making the most rational or sane choices. But some things they felt were completely in the hands of gods, and that wasn't their want, but rather something the divine wished and passed through them. Something that falls into that category of the pharaonic law against offense or disrespect to the sun god. It was considered one of the most awful crimes you could commit, and that's pretty difficult because Egypt didn't really have much crime thanks to their efficient baboon police force. If you vandalized or robbed a temple, committed any form of personal disrespect, or were otherwise found guilty of any offense related to the sun god, you were usually sentenced to be burned alive, usually accompanied by a ritual that sacrificed the individual to the god. While the ancient Egyptians rarely practiced actual human sacrifices, this was one of the few exceptions. While burning alive is painful enough to begin with it was considered the most horrific death of all by ancient Egyptians because of that ritual significance. They believed strongly in preserving the physical body for life after death and believed that destroying the person's physical body completely by burning would leave them with no vessel in the afterlife, left to drift listlessly. While the gods could still technically intervene to help this person should they feel they deserve it, it was about as terrifying as a punishment as a believer in ancient Egyptian society could imagine. Disturbing decision number nine is boys in the breeze. Sesotris gets to be remembered for two things. He was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, and he put up giant hoo-hahs and wee-wees everywhere he went. Thankfully, these two feats of his went hand in hand as he would send warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretch the kingdom further than anyone else ever had. After each battle, he would commemorate his success by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's bits on it. You can literally trace a map of this dude's conquest via dongs on paper. Herodotus saw some of Sesotris's monuments firsthand. For the most part, these pubic pillars were engraved with the usual self-glory crap. Who he was, how he had subdued his enemies, and how certain he was that the gods were in his favor of his invade everyone policy. But guys, that's not all. The type of pubic pillar you received, male versus female, was a battle review system. Forget Google reviews and TripAdvisor ratings. Leaving a ladies versus man's pubic pillar would define if the opposing army had fought valiantly or like a bunch of sissies. 1500 years after they're erected, they still stood in Syria, engraved with the genitals of failure. Disturbing decision number eight is the Ram Blood Bevy. Pasatik III was the last pharaoh of the 26th dynasty, having a pitiful six month run before a full scale Persian invasion rolled into town led by King Cambyses II. A few days after his coronation, rain fell at Thebes, which was a rare event that frightened some Egyptians, who interpreted this as a bad omen and were already dubious of the young, inexperienced king. They were right to be. Sadly, was easily defeated at the Battle of Pasilium due to how little time he'd been on the throne and how unprepared Egypt was for this invasion. That, and he was betrayed by one of his allies. So he fled to Memphis with his army, who'd lost all hope in their pharaoh, and watch as he is captured. His stupid ass is carried back to Egypt in chains when he should have just stayed on the throne and accepted his fate in the first place. Herodotus writes how all his daughters and wives were taken captives, his wife slain, his nobleman sentenced to death. Cambius brought all of them before the deposed pharaoh to try and elicit a reaction, a weakness. But only when the pharaoh is shown an old friend of his turned into a homeless beggar does he actually become upset and break. The unusual compassion actually spared the pharaoh death, who Cambius is kept in his court for consultation. You You'd think he'd appreciate that since that literally never happens in history. But Basantic tries to raise a rebellion and it fails miserably. With a death sentence imminent, the former pharaoh decides to take his life, not by any traditional, normal, painless method. No, 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 no. This guy chugs down a vat of ram's blood, a literal vat, then promptly died. Number seven, Cleopatra's methods. Male rulers took the name Ptolemy and queens were Cleopatra. 
Her lineage runs deep in the heart of Egypt, but Cleopatra, fun fact, she was not actually Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this new wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted centuries. As Cleopatra got older, she was determined to learn Egyptian. And due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. And then in comes Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had a history of his own, obviously, and his, rather than family and power, was filled more with, you know, lust more than anything. He was known to sleep around and then use their power after doing the dirty. When these two crossed paths, history was never the same. In October of 50 BCE, Cleopatra had fled to Syria. Once there, she established an army and returned two years later to face her brother. Cleopatra knew that during this time, she needed all the support she could get, specifically now from the Romans. At the same time, Caesar was looking to collect debts from Cleopatra's father, so they both relied on each other in some way. It was a match made in heaven. Your most compatible has been updated. Right swipe. I would right swipe on Alexander the Great, for sure. I'd be like, who's this handsome man? Mm. Nicknamed Bald Adulterer. Okay, you know, he's trouble. Number six, King Tut. One of the greatest mysteries is, of course, the history of the young King Tut. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC, but during his time of ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh died at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was seen again. Howard Carter discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful here in history. Sure, it's exciting finding mummies and discovering your history and all that jazz, but when King Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they damaged him. So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age. We have some ideas though, it's not entirely hopeless. It's believed right now that King Tut had a broken leg. After some 3D scans were done, it appears the king wasn't in the best shape prior. He may have fallen off of a chariot. So if Tut passed away at an early age, out of nowhere, this could mean another mystery is afoot. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's resting place. So yes, on one hand, 3D scanning technology is vital when it comes to these ancient sites. We're able to figure out King Tut's medical issues from thousands of years ago. It's impressive, it's great. But thanks to this new technology, we're also finding hidden chambers in these tombs as well. Another theory surrounding the queen, the lost queen, Nefertiti, is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this at all. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. But, but King Tut passed away at age 19, so many believe that his own burial chamber at that point wasn't even built yet. So instead, they had to use hers, they had to improvise. A radar survey conducted around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us a possible hidden chamber, right behind the north wall of the burial chamber. We still haven't found her final resting place, but perhaps this recent 2021 discovery of an ancient city will hold us off until then. Look at this, we missed this on the news. Where was all this? Crazy. Number four, a fake beard. Not really unusual considering the times, but this is definitely worth a mention. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and there were only just a few that were women in total. But during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. This was her goal, this was her vision. The pharaoh fake beard, massive muscles. Historians believe this was done as an act of politics. It was done on purpose to make a point. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson then took the throne, Thutmose III. And then he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Number three, no more religion. This was a huge deal in ancient Egypt, rightfully so. The pharaoh Akhenaten thought it would be a great idea to just end multiple religious beliefs. Yep, just uh, stop. Okay, now we just do the one. Traditional Egyptian culture would believe in multiple gods, but this pharaoh couldn't keep up, so he convinced everybody to believe in just one god, Aten. Well, only days after his passing, the people of Egypt said, screw that, we're gonna go back to multiple beliefs. That was working a lot better for us, thank you, sir. And then also we're destroying every piece of evidence that involves you for trying that nonsense. Yeah, temples, cooking pots, anything with his image, gone and ideally forgotten. It wasn't until the 19th century when we realized this pharaoh once ruled. Number two, hippo problems. Do you have any idea how fast hippos are in real life? I had no clue my entire life. They're really fast, they fly at you, they're like dinosaurs. Hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I'll just lead with that. 
Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh ever, so it felt fitting to include some pet problems in our list. We don't know much about the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, that's where we're talking. But what we do know for certain is that King Menes ruled over Egypt during a peaceful time, and he was stomped to death by a hippo. It's literally how his history.com says it, in that order. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and a hippo got him. I don't think there's a harder way to go out, honestly, in my opinion. It's a mystery still, thousands of years later, but look at zoos today. I don't know, maybe a hippo didn't like living like a king. Maybe he wanted to live like Shrek and just splash around and be dirty. He's an animal. He's literally a hippo, you know? And finally, coming in at number one, a renewed passport. I'll be honest, right now, I currently have no idea where my passport is. Chris, do you know where yours is? Yeah. Wow, we have an adult here. Wow, an adult, that's lovely. I always panic and search for it 13 hours before a flight. I am the worst to travel with. Passports are important, obviously, and they're a pain in the ass to replace. But did you know you can still get one even if you've been dead for, I don't know, thousands of years? There's a fun fact. Pharaoh Ramses II, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, got a passport back in 1974. Yeah, you heard me. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided it's time to send the lost king off to Paris to get, you know, a little touched up, being dead that long and all. Now obviously you're not gonna list this pharaoh as luggage, that's so rude. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute. On the passport he had his age, his occupation, king, obviously, and in case it wasn't clear, it was stated that the king too was deceased. Anyone who's seen The Mummy can obviously, you know, relax at that point. Kicking off the list at number 10, KV-55. Located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KV-55, was found by Edward Arden back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than name is because we really don't know who was inside it yet. Even the walls outside of the tomb, they aren't covered with any hieroglyphs to tip us off or give us any hints. It's just bare which is kind of eerie. As you walk down the 20 steps towards KV-55, you'll notice markings on the entrance. Markings that show that the entrance was widened since it was first cut, along with its ceilings being raised higher. So whatever was in there needed the room. The only hint as to who was buried remains on the walls. One hieroglyph remains and it was discovered in 1907 and it translates to the evil one that shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out. See, usually with these ancient tombs, it's the opposite. The description for who's inside the tomb had also been destroyed. So we have no idea who or what is in KV-55. Number nine, King Teti. The Pyramid of Teti was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty, and while it's not flashy or massive as these other pyramids, the insides contain the oldest writing in the religious world. Pretty insane. Now these texts go back to 2400 BC, way back when we used, you know, BBM. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this King Teddy could ascend to the heavens after his death. There are spells and incantations meant to free the king's soul and arrive in the cosmos. More specifically, for Teddy to become a star in the sky and then join Osiris and Orion in the God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to said heavens. World's oldest instruction manual for the win. Number 8. Queen Nefertiti After a scan was done on King Tut's tomb, there were cracks found on the north and earth walls. East, Taylor, East, not Earth. There were cracks found on the north and east side walls. So we believe that this is a secret passageway to Queen Nefertiti, the ruler during the 14th century BC, and also wife to King Tut. Queen Nefertiti's parents are also still unknown to this day, so that adds to it. And with ancient texts depicting that these kings and queens would leave Earth and then later return, perhaps they are both descendants of extraterrestrials. And this flying sun disk that they worshipped was not the sun, but rather a winged alien ancestor. Disturbing decision number seven is excessive children. If you know anything about anyone in Egypt, you already know this is about Ramesses' ancient ass. And I say that not because he lived in ancient times, but because this is the king who somehow lived to 96 in ancient Egypt and still only died because someone ripped a hole in his jugular like they're opening a bag of Doritos. Ramesses enjoyed his time alive right up until the very end. He built more statues and monuments than any other king of Egypt, and he slept with more women than anyone too. Maybe more than any human being ever. Someone has to have that title out there. If I had to guess based on who exists in documented history, he's taking the cake. Pun intended. The dude had a bare minimum of a hundred guaranteed children. 
guaranteed. If he has that many confirmed, there was definitely a lot more unconfirmed. Gets crazier when I mention he had some of these children with his own children. This was ancient Egypt after all. Gotta keep that royal bloodline pure by making their blood thick as mud, you know? He married at least three of his own kids, including his firstborn. He may or may not have married four. Historians aren't sure whether his wife Hotemeyer was his daughter or his sister, but since this is Ramesses that we're talking about, there's no reason that daughter, sister, and wife have to be mutually exclusive. Ramesses had over 200 wives in his lifetime and pretty much outlived all of them. Disturbing decision number six is bring the squad, another law made to serve Egyptian pharaoh's own interests while simultaneously screwing over everyone in the general vicinity, and believe me, there was a few of those, was a law surrounding these servant contracts. See, royals and nobilities in the old kingdom had super fun clause written into their hieroglyphic employee contracts in the fine print, stating that when they drop dead, the whole staff is coming with them, dead or alive, take your pick. A dead king needed his squad to support him in the afterlife. On the practical side, you couldn't leave any anyone behind who might cause trouble for the new king. It made for a mass display of power as these weren't just lowly servants being tossed down there. When the practice started, it was people of incredibly high rank and tremendous value to Egyptian state. This went to instill the lower class with tremendous awe and respect for these early kings. What better way to show off your power than to throw away your wealth? What's more valuable than your whole family? In a recent vid, the top 10 repulsive queens from ancient Egypt you never learned about, I mentioned how Lady Pharaoh Mernith is buried with 50 of her servants. All of them were alive when interred. Almost 600 victims are found buried with King Dejer, and King Ahab had 41 courtiers, retainers, and others who downed poison and were buried with him. Egyptian royalty stopped this practice in the early first dynasty, but it continued in a more innocent form. Yushabati, the little carved figurines that can magically serve the deceased in the afterlife. Disturbing decision number five is the piss fetish. Sarasostris, the pubic pillar guy, had a son named Pharos who had gone blind at a young age. Now this was likely some kind of disease, or family genetic, or maybe even the result of an infection, or the result of pissing off the god. See, the legend says Pharaohs was fed up with the Nile flooding and it refusing to listen to his decree to stop flooding. It's a fucking river, what are you thinking? So the dummy tossed a spear at it in frustration, I don't know, rampant stupidity maybe, assuming that would work, and for said stupidity and insolence, he was allegedly struck blind by the gods. Ten years go by and an oracle happens to roll through Egypt with a message for the blind pharaoh that he could get his sight back. All he had to do, she told him, was wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who had never slept with anyone other than her husband. Off pharaohs went, no questions asked, such as what temperature it needed to be. If dark yellow or clear is better, you know, the fixins. He immediately finds his wife and either hands her a bucket or takes a knee because somehow that piss got in the man's eyes as the prophet requested. Yet nothing happened. Pharaohs was still blind and now his wife has some explanation to do. First though, Ferris was very focused on not being blind, so he had the army round up every married woman in town. Everyone's given a bucket, or like said, the king took a knee. History does not preserve the piss to eyes transportation method. Finally, after being peed on by an undisclosed amount of women, Pharaoh saw the light, thanks to the one woman in all of Egypt who hadn't cheated on her husband, which Pharaoh's immediately changed by having her divorce her husband and become his new wife on the spot. Then together, they burnt his last wife at the stake and lived happily ever after. Disturbing decision number Number four is Hepsed. Back in ancient Egypt, things weren't quite so simple because apparently a pharaoh who had ruled for 30 years also needed to perform a minor Olympics by themselves. Egyptians observed a strange ritual called Hepsed, which culminated in the pharaoh running around a racetrack in the courtyard of their palace wearing a kilt with an animal's tail attached to it. And woe betide anyone who didn't complete the course. It became one of the oldest and longest running rituals of Egyptian history, having existed for 5,000 years. It usually took place on the fourth month of the Egyptian calendar so it coincided with the Nile flooding. The pharaoh would make numerous offerings to the gods and having a lavish recrowning ceremony. Some occasions concluded with the pharaoh being given a ceremonial bow and arrow he'd shoot towards the four corners of the kingdom just to show how far reaching their power was. Once a pharaoh had celebrated their first Hepsed, they had to repeat the ceremony every three years until their death. The main event had the pharaoh as said dressed in a short kilt with the tail of a bull or some similar creature attached to the back and placed 
placed on a running track in front of an audience of dignitaries where they'd be made to run as quickly as possible around the track. Besides simply giving the pharaoh a chance to demonstrate their vigor and athleticism, Egyptologists are unclear precisely what the point of the pharaoh's bizarre foot race really was. Some have suggested it was purely ceremonial and represented the pharaoh outrunning old age. Others claim that it was intended like the bow and arrow to represent the pharaoh reaching all parts of their kingdom. Others have claimed that there was much more practical reason for it. If the pharaoh wasn't able to complete the course, then they were no longer fit to rule and they would be promptly sacrificed to make way for their younger, fitter successor. Disturbing decision number three is to let the priests punish. There was a time period where the power of the pharaohs slipped away into the hands of the priests who puppeteered young and inexperienced throne heirs into dumb decisions and handing over too much power. Priests' influence and power over the common people increased continually over the years and before long they were being consulted for far more than they had ever been before. Those in power knew better than to question the priests too much as they were considered able to contact and gain support of the gods. Thus, it would be like questioning the gods, which as you know from point one is a big ol' no-no. This power would also be able to potentially influence large amounts of people to do their bidding. So naturally, in the latter days of ancient Egypt, the priesthood now found itself involved in matters of court. They would bring in a statue of the sun god and set papyri before it with different options for important decisions. In court, they were genuinely two papers deciding innocent or guilt. The statue was supposed to turn towards whichever the correct paper was showing the will of the gods. Of course, this gave the priests a chance to manipulate the statue's movements and essentially decide the court cases based on their own opinions, biases, and whims. Disturbing decision number two is river seedlings, aka how the pharaoh would whip it out in front of the entire kingdom once a year and yank his proverbial chain until completion into the Nile. This came from the story of how Ra created the earth through the act of sacred self-pleasure, something that the Egyptians glorified and saw as an act connecting oneself with the gods, their own spiritual essence, and their physical being. And they're not wrong, it's an incredibly healthy approach to viewing self-pleasure. The ancient world, especially ancient Egypt, was obsessed with growth, birth, creation, Creation, and that which gave life with many myths and legends springing up in and around the concept of fertility. The Nile was also revered for life-giving qualities, so it should come as no surprise that the ceremonial spilling of seed during an annual festival devoted to it, Ra and the life, would occur. The symbolism here is pretty powerful when we consider the fact that the ancients viewed time in a circular format rather than a linear succession of moments. In fact, the ancient Egyptian word for seed, progeny, and describing the flood of the Nile was all the same word, MTWT. No idea how to pronounce it, not gonna try. The ancient Egyptians knew life giving, fertilizing ways of the predictable floods of the Nile, and they saw the same properties in seed. So, after your pharaoh had finished his duty by the Nile, the noblemen would take their turn as a group, followed by all the men of Egypt being invited to spill their seed in the river of life as well. Call it community bonding. Disturbing decision number one is the daughter deal. Khufu, the son of Snefru, decided to one-up his old man when he commissioned the Great Pyramid of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world. Even though there's still much left to speculation, there's a few things we do know for certain about the Great Pyramid, such as the fact they are oversized tombs dedicated to the pharaoh's ego. They were originally covered in white limestone and gold. They were never used for grain storage. It took Khufu about 20 years to have his build, and he sold his daughter as a pleasure worker in the process. Let's uh, let's pause on that last one real quick. Yeah, so Khufu didn't really have the funds to spend on a pyramid of this size and grandeur, but he was determined to beat out his daddy. Herodotus, the OG history recorder of Egypt, makes more than one mention of it, and usually with a lot of attitude because even he thought it was a little rank and Herodotus had seen some shit. To quote, Khufu descended to such a degree of infamy that he sold his own daughter in a brothel and ordered her to exact, they do not say how much, but she exacted a certain amount of money as much as her father had ordered her to. Like in ancient Babylon, ancient Egypt at least saw being a working girl as a divine and respectable act done for the gods. So it wasn't like everyone in the kingdom, including Khufu, went on to destroy this poor girl's life. Rather deemed what she did an honorable and godly service. But still, pretty effed up that her dad would blow all his money on a project to the point he asked his own daughter to hit the streets. You're the pharaoh, this is your project, and this is free love ancient Egypt, baby. So why don't you go get your own bag? 
We're gonna start with peace treaties. Egypt all just know Ramses II as the pharaoh who restored Egypt's relations with Syria and built a lot of neat temples in the desert back in the 1200s BC. And he's the one in that Disney movie whose first son gets smoked by the plague. Kind of a wild guy, so we'll talk about him quite a bit in this vid. Anyways, for over two centuries, the Egyptians fought against the Hittite Empire for control of lands in modern day Syria. The conflict gave rise to a bloody boot down, such as the 1247 BC Battle of Kadesh. But by the time of the Pharaoh Ramesses II, neither side had emerged as a clear victor, and this was just becoming all drawn out and bloody and just plain stupid, especially with both empires facing threats from people outside each other. But who's ever gonna be the first to wave the white flag, let's be real, when it comes to two dudes? Y'all are notoriously known for just beating each other up, shaking hands, and best friends again. So in 1259 BC, the two said, ah, to hell with it, let's do lunch, and Ramses II and the Hittite king Hatsusili III negotiated a famous peace treaty, one that was either the first known in creation or one of the earliest ever. This agreement ended the conflict and decreed the two kingdoms would aid each other in the event of an evasion by a third party. This treaty is now recognized as one of the earliest surviving peace accords, and a copy can be seen above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council. How about some ancient Egyptian body dysmorphia? Because bodies are supposed to look like this, right? That's what Akhenaten was probably wondering, and it must have been awkward as hell for fine as cell queen Nefertiti and normal looking son King Tut to try and lie their way through any reply to that. Because this whack job was known for two things. Firstly, as who forced monotheism on Egypt so brutally that when he died, his son had to awkwardly erase his legacy. And secondly, he was one funny looking dude. He had an hourglass figure like a BBL baddie, an elongated head with a square jaw jutting out, big curved almond eyes, and let's say he could have filled out a bra better than me. So, Egyptians like to play Photoshop with their selfies the way we do now, and the first depictions of Ak, his body and head are normal. But after he forced monotheism, that literally destroyed the economy and empire, his gender in sculptures and carvings became more ambiguous. Three explanations. First, he's the most hated pharaoh in history. So I mean, come on, artistic license, get some anger out. Second, perhaps his changing appearance was metaphorical, meant to portray Ak as the father and mother of all humankind. Third is that it was a genetic disorder, such as amitrace excess syndrome, where the body released equal levels of both hormones. But we all know what the likely one was, seeing as these guys could quite literally not keep their hands or really any appendage out of their family members. I'm not gonna lie, I can't handle having eyeliner on for three hours that me and my roommate go out. Meanwhile, the pharaohs had obligatory face beat like they were working at ancient Sephora every day. Early Greek traders who visited Egypt were astonished by the sophistication and precision with which Egyptians took care of their skin and hair and decorated their bodies. Europeans remarked that almost everyone was wearing makeup even in public places and that'd be accurate as both men and women were known to wear copious amounts of the stuff believing it gave them the protection of the gods Horus and Ra who were always fighting or banging each other and doing so in a full face of makeup like some spectacular fursuit wearing drag queens. The only distinguishing factor between men and women's makeup was that men's makeup was simple while women's was often heavier and more complex. The distinguishing factor of all makeup, however, was wealth. Nobles could afford the fresher or less diluted products, while lower status had to use makeup from poorer quality materials, which sucks since they worked in the sun all day, and higher quality coal you lined your eyes with, the better it reduced sun reflection. This act will also protect them from evil spirits and eye diseases, as they believed their makeup had magical hearing powers, and they weren't entirely wrong. Research has shown that lead-based cosmetics worn along the Nile actually staved off eye infections. Number seven, dozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshiping, so grab your red scarves and start waving them around. Just north of the Step Pyramid of the Pharaoh Doser, archaeologist August Marionette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium is a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. Now, this was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls. They were basically these bulls that were said to be sacred, and after their death, they would become immortal. Remember that, that's important. Today at Saqqara, there's this massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's massive, and along the sides of them are 24 chambers, each with sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Now, inside these boxes were animal remains, just bones and all. But back then, in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. That was a no-go. You had to mummify them. So how are these tombs built, first of all, so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and where do these bones come from? Perhaps these are the remains of the Apis bull. After all, that's the inspiration for the Minotaurs, so maybe alien ancestors looked a lot more jacked than we may think. Number six, dung beetles. This one isn't exactly a pharaoh at all, but it's too good to leave out, especially if we're talking about aliens here. It's important. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way. Think about that for a second. That is 
let's talk about it. Some animals follow the sun. You know, turtles sprint to the ocean the second they're born to avoid getting plucked up by birds. Now these insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their towards it. Literally, their, their poop, they would roll it towards the skies, which is insane. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or even in movies, their presence is known. Near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there is a massive scarab monument. And there's even a legend still to this day behind said statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. And you'd also probably be a little bit dizzy. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun as well. Also known as the scarab face god, which terrifying when you imagine that. Are these bugs just trying to get home into space to their bug alien master? Why does he need so much poop? Whatever DIY project they're working on in the Milky Way probably doesn't smell too good. Number five, Lord Nefertiru. For this next piece of evidence, we'll be directing our focus to the land down under. Australian aliens, baby, let's do it. In the Brisbane Water National Park, to be specific. Egyptian hieroglyphs educate us on our past. There's still so much we don't know, but it's fun to find UFO looking objects within them. It's fun to speculate as we are right now. But when Egyptian texts appear around the world in the middle of nowhere, those UFO hieroglyphs get a bit more concerning. Like the Gosford glyphs, for example. Discovered in the 1970s at Karyong, there's around 300 engravings spread over two sandstone walls. The hieroglyphs are strikingly similar to that of Egypt's. There's birds, even the markings of a scarab, which are those Milky Way poop pushers that I just talked about earlier. Egyptologist Raymond Johnson believes that this is the burial site of Egyptian royal family member Lord Nefertiru, who met his fate around 2600 BC, with some panels telling the story of two prince brothers who came from Egypt and subsequently became shipwrecked. But other panels get into the extraterrestrial goodness. Some of these Gosford glyphs have UFO shapes, with scarabs, birds, and sun symbols popping up as well. Maybe we did have alien aid when it came to laying these royal family members to rest. Number four, Userkaf. Remember earlier when I was talking about those extremely heavy granite coffins? Well, the Sun Temple in Egypt may give us more alien clues as to their purpose. Discovered in 1842, this was the base of a giant monument that apparently used to stand over 150 feet tall. Built by the pharaoh Yuzakaf, founder of the 5th dynasty of Egypt, the temple translates to Stronghold of Ra. Ra being the sun god. This temple at Abu Ghraib was home to one of the world's largest monoliths and its purpose may blow your mind. This obelisk was built out of granite. Now they made things out of granite back then because it contained quartz. Quartz, due to piezoelectricity, was able to convert the Earth's vibrations into energy. Nikola Tesla did something similar. He figured out standing waves, which was the ability to pass energy through the air. Perhaps these granite monoliths were used to teleport people or goods. That would explain the last point about those Australian glyphs. To be fair, I have zero idea how Bluetooth works either. Alien airdropped in Egypt. I'm here for this theory. Number three, Khufu. In order to become a god in the afterlife, these kings would build massive temples or pyramids. The Giza pyramids were built over 4,500 years ago, and to this day, they draw in about 15 million visitors a year. Pharaoh Khufu's is the largest pyramid in Giza, and it was the first pyramid that they started to build, obviously taking the longest. Reaching up to 147 meters high, it took 2.3 million rocks to create this landmark, and its alignment with Orion's belt gives it an extraterrestrial vibe, and with Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeting aliens built the pyramids, obvi, we now have to ask just how did thousands of workers achieve this? The placement of the pyramid is also unique as well. It's aligned perfectly with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. That much accuracy back then with the stars and the earth and the heavens, they must have gotten help from alien friends or else they had the world's biggest protractor. Number two, King Tut. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with said king. It's not uncommon to be buried with your goods. It's why Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so that grave robbers wouldn't snoop around and steal your entire family heritage. It was made so nothing could get out, which is insane. But two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other gold. Now with iron being even more rare than gold in the Bronze Age, this was a big deal. And with recent advancements in technology, we were able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometry. And according to the journal Meteorites in the Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that this material is of extraterrestrial origin. And finally, number one, the Great Pyramid of Cholula. There are many parallels between Egyptian and Maya civilizations. The two cultures are so far apart, both in time and distance, and they also never made contact. But both pyramids are made with steps, and both have stone serpents. 
The vault arches are also strikingly similar, and hieroglyphs within share a lot of the same symbolism. These hieroglyphs include advanced mathematics that they say was bestowed upon them, also from these sky gods. Was this just one landing site of our alien ancestors? Let us know in the comments below with all your thoughts. Number 10, Tutankhamun. This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9, Djoser. So, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the Limestone Step Pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well, knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8, Amenhotep III. Okay, on to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt, but it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself, is, is that weird? Probably. All right, you annoying ancient astronaut people, this is for you, Tut's space knife. I am not sitting here doing the work for y'all pretending we all don't know who King Tut is. He was the child pharaoh, smoked by a hippo bite, cursed tomb, blah, 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 blah. So we're just going to get right to it and say he had a knife literally from space. Specifically, a small dagger, but whatever effing y'all, this thing is so sharp. To this day, the TSA would tackle you sooner than let you board anything with it. They found it in Tut's tomb in 1920s with all that other magical treasury hunky-dory that they stole out of there. And it was originally believed to be forged from the iron heart of a meteorite. Originally, ah, keyword, see, Egyptians didn't have the ability to smelt. They weren't actually suitably advanced in that realm. So they especially wouldn't be able to forge a weapon from space metal, let alone crack open a meteorite to get to it, or know that was even an option. This has led historians to presume that the dagger was a gift from a foreign nation that did possess smelty technology. While historians are pretty confident the foreign nation wasn't the Martians, they haven't explicitly ruled that out either, so I guess those ancient alien guys might have a point. If you like stuff like this, check out our top 10 alien hieroglyphs found in ancient history video. The story of how two pharaohs throw down over pet hippos. So, Pharaoh Sekinenri Teo, I'm gonna call him Sek, the second, kept a pool full of pet hippopotamuses, letting his massive pets splash and play all day. Obviously, you don't get close because these are blind rage death animal machines, but this guy loved his hippos so much he could kill for them. He was willing to die for them. In fact, he literally did just that. This is back when Egypt was divided and the most powerful Egyptian kingdom was called called Haikos, which was ruled by Pharaoh Apopi. Being a lesser king, Sek was required to pay tributes to Apopi out of respect. He could handle the humiliation of living under the tyranny of another man, RIP fragile male ego, but as long as Apopi didn't rub it in or act like an ass about it. So that's exactly what Apopi did. He went right for the sore spot by telling Sek to get rid of his hippos. Apparently they were too loud and Apopi couldn't sleep at night in his own house that was 750 kilometers away. Yeah, no. Sek says, hey, I can handle you bullying me constantly. Believe the hippos out of this, and he would not tolerate any further insults to his hippos. This, he declared, was grounds for war. That's what they did. Sek even died in combat, fighting for his right to a hippo pool. The war didn't end when he died, however. His son kept it going. Two generations of kings fought for a hippo pool, and in time, they won. By the end of the war, Egypt had unified once more. 
all because of one man's love for his hippos. And speaking of, after that unification happened, it paved the way for the royal trendsetter Narmer. Because before our boy Narmer came along, the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt were worn by the pre-dynastic kings. Narmer was famously the first king to be portrayed wearing both crowns symbolizing that union. This would later be replaced with the striped crown, a continuous representation of union called a nemesis. Adorning the top was the uraeus, an upright cobra that symbolized symbolized the ancient Egyptian goddess Wajet, meaning the pharaoh was ready to strike his enemies with deadly venom. Trendsetter Narmer doesn't stop at crowns, he's the first ruler to portray themselves in a royal beard, which every Egyptian pharaoh wore afterwards, whether man or woman. Then there's Narmer's implementation of an official who has the most important task of carrying the pharaoh's magic sandals. Egyptian pharaoh's sandals were the only piece of clothing that separated them from the land of Egypt and rightfully symbolized the union between the heavenly god world and the earthly human world. King Tut's sandals were famously inscribed with pictures of his enemies meaning with every step, he was crushing the enemies of Egypt. In the famous Narmer palette, he's also seen wearing a fake bull tail, which symbolized strength to rule the country of the Nile, but that trend didn't stick. Hey, so Ramses has 50 lost daughters. What a crappy dad, doesn't know where all his kids even are. Kinda understandable when you have 102 of them, with about 9 women, however. Made possible by somehow living to be 91 in an age where people died at like 20. Suffice to say, he had lots of leisure time. Of course, not all the children were children at the same time. Ramses II became began his family long before he took over as king, and he reigned for 66 years. He spread the brood out over most of that time. So archaeologists announced in 1820 they uncovered a tomb built by Ramses and that 52 or so of his sons happened to be in it. They finally recently started excavations after a few decades, and now we know that the mausoleum is the largest and most complex found to date in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, with at least 62 rooms. But Egyptian kings normally didn't build mausoleums for their offspring. Their principal wives, yes, over in the Valley of Queens, but their kids, no. If it turns out that only Ramesses' sons are in the tomb, where are the 50 daughters? Sexism can answer that! Males were regarded as potential heirs to the throne, and the princesses were not, so they weren't held in high esteem and didn't get a fancy resting place. Doesn't mean they didn't have value. Ramesses designated at least three of his daughters as princess queens. Woo! No? No, oh no, what that suggests isn't pretty. But what isn't known is whether or not they were actually married to him and, you know, producing, or if the title was a way of honoring selected daughters from tertiary wives. Historians, however, are pretty confident on which one it is. This would be the end of the story, but for a single question. Why would a latex protection manufacturer name its product for a man who had 102 kids? Are you choosing cats or your empire? In Egypt, the penalty for killing a cat was death. This wasn't just a law against cruelty to animals or sadistic Friday the 13th butchery. All you had to do was accidentally run over a cat with your chariot and you're done. This is mostly due to the animal being closely linked with the cat-headed goddess of warfare and balls of twine, Bastet. They were also revered for the role they played in protecting food stores and homes from disease by killing pests like snakes and rats. Basically, pharaohs coined the three laws of robotics a millennia before Asimov and used them to protect the thing that poops under the stairs. And I, I don't think there are exceptions. One writer, Didorus Siculus, even recorded that the king of Egypt himself personally tried to intervene and save a Roman man who'd accidentally killed a cat. His people did not give a single F, however, ignored the ruler, showed no mercy, caring literally negative a thousand if it meant risking war with Rome. They formed a mob, hung him, and left his body in the streets while the pharaoh sent a real awkward fruit basket apology to Rome. Perhaps the greatest example of a pharaoh placing the well-being of cats above that of his own people, however, was Pharaoh Pismatic III literally told his army not to fight the Persians' advancement because these smart little twists had painted the image of Bastet on their shields and marched behind a line of dogs, sheep, and cats. In their words, whatever animals the Egyptians hold dear. The Egyptians, under threat of death from the pharaoh, had no choice but to let the Persian ruler walk straight into the city unchecked. He then murked anyone who dared to challenge him, using the shields with cats drawn on them because you can't even strike an image of a cat in ancient Egypt. Cambyses, the ruler's name, celebrated in a dignified noble fashion, marching the Egyptian armies past him as he threw cats at them and screamed insults at their gods. We aren't 100% sure who the first pharaoh was, but it was probably Catfish Chisel. The only way we know the lineage for early Egyptian kinship is the highly damaged Palermo Stone, which was a black slab of granite carved full of the names of kings up to the 5th dynasty. The part of the stone where the first and second king of the 1st dynasty is inscribed is bust to clean off. Although it is generally accepted that the first king was Narmer, aka Menes. The second one was Aha. Even without enough evidence to prove beyond a doubt, I can't get past the Aha thing. The name of Narmer is composed to two ideograms. The catfish reading as Nar and the chisel reading as Mer. The location of Narmer's body has eluded archaeologists for two centuries now. The first Egyptian pharaohs used to build a type of tomb called a Mabasta, and they did so until the third dynasty when they started 
started busting out pyramids. It's theorized Narmer is in one of those. But then Egyptologists have discovered a large field of pre-dynastic and early dynastic royal tombs in Umm al -Kab, and the Narmer's name is identified in an inscription found. However, this is Egypt. The site had suffered disturbances, tomb robbing, and disrest for the past 5,000 years, making it impossible to know which one of the bodies is the precise tomb of Narmer. To this day, archaeologists and Egyptologists disagree on whether Narmer was buried at Saqqara or Umm al -Kab, and in the end, his cause of death isn't even fully known. Just that of a philosopher in Mantheo saying the reign of Narmer ends when he was carried off by a hippopotamus and perished. And last but not least, believe my eyes. Even though it may be a lie. Who knows? I don't, but I love a good rhyme. While it was likely a disease genetically inherited in his DNA, the official Egyptian story is that Pharaohs was cursed by the gods with blindness. Apparently, when the Nile was flooding, Pharaohs got fed up with it, and instead of letting the water do its thing and calm down, he chucked a spear at it. Because yes, throwing a spear at a river would probably change things. For his insolence and stupidity, the gods struck his ass Pharaoh's vibes this way the best he can for 10 years before he meets an oracle that either wanted to pull history's most hilariously mean prank or genuinely believed the gods had passed on this message. But the oracle tells Pharaoh's all he's got to do is wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who's never slept with any other person than her husband her whole life. Okay. Well, Pharaoh's isn't asking questions, he's here for solutions. He finds his wife and says, babe, I want to spice things up in the bedroom, I have an idea. And the two of them give it a try. Only it doesn't work. So now he's still blind, and his wife has some explaining to do. Before she does that though, Pharaoh's needs some more urine and he needed it now. So every woman in town is gathered up and given a pot, which he then sat there dumping its contents into his eyes, one after each other. No, I don't know if he waited for it to cool down. I do know it was probably the color of French's mustard though, seeing as Egyptians literally only drank warm beer. So so imagine. But somehow Pharaoh's finds the one who's not cheating on her husband or hadn't banged someone before getting married, and the one of these warm beer pee buckets works. And I wish I was kidding, but the official Egyptian records say, yeah, magic peas did this. His sight is back, and he asks for the hand of the magic pea wielding woman so they can marry on the spot. All the while, her husband awkwardly watches the consequences of his wife not cheating on him unfold. Oh, and then Pharaoh's burned his old wife to death. Or at least that's how the legend goes. I highly doubt that it really did restore his eyes eyesight and maybe he just ordered historians to write a good story to explain a weird habit. You know, f fetish. We got a f fetish here. Sammy Lacker. <laughs> Number 10, Overshadowed and the Beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III. But she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came, of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh? The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah, 
Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen so there. Number 7. Hot Shepsut now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband and everything she did from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6. Thutmose III Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number 7, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust, so while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose III of France? Either way, Thutmose III. He helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make mama proud. Number 5. Xerxes I You've most likely heard of this guy. If not from his historically inaccurate portrayal in 300, then at least from one or two history classes. But Adam, wasn't he the emperor of Persia? Yeah, well guess what my little bees? Egypt was part of the Persian Empire, which makes him pharaoh as well. This guy gets a pretty bad rap in history. But who wrote that history? The Greeks who despised him for his attempted invasion of Greece. Oh, I'm not saying he was great or anything. In fact, he had a bit of a disregard for the traditions of the Egyptians and their way of life. But you cannot tell me that he was not significant in history. Xerxes the Great makes this list for his infamy more than anything else. Number 4. Akhenaten So this is going to be the second not so beloved pharaoh on this list. But disdain for Akhenaten didn't come from war, or the fact that his massive army was defeated by a group of a couple hundred Greeks. No, Akhenaten here was infamous for his devout following of a singular god, Aten, the god of the sun. He actually moved the capital of Egypt to a new location that he titled Akhetaten, or Horizon of Aten. And he kind of made everyone else worship the single god Aten as well. He was famous for a different reason though. Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti. She played a huge part in his religious plans and she is well known in history for the limestone bust that was made of her and has been copied so many freaking times. Number 3. Khufu When you think of Egypt, there is likely one thing that pops straight into your mind. If you say anything other than the Great Pyramids of Giza, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200 and you lose. Khufu is the pharaoh you have to thank for this wonder of the ancient world. We still sort of don't know exactly how it was constructed, but this goliath limestone and mud brick structure was the tallest building in the world for like 4,000 years. It was built as the housing for his tomb and as his stairway to heaven. No, not the Led Zeppelin song. It has three chambers inside of it plus a gallery that we've discovered so far. As for what else Khufu contributed to ancient Egyptian life, we don't have much in the way of texts about that yet. But if this is the main thing, then I mean, I'd take it. Number 2. Cleopatra. How could she not be on this list? She was the very last pharaoh Egypt ever had, and she was arguably one of the most famous ones. Not only becoming a figure in history, but a character in literature, theater, and media. Cleopatra VII was pharaoh in Egypt from 51 to 30 BC, and it was one hell of a reign. She introduced tons of reforms to improve the Egyptian economy. She was an awesome diplomat and a scholar. She didn't have things too easy though. 
having to fight her own brother for the throne and having to do some diplomacy with various famous Romans. Things kind of fizzle out near the end, but she certainly ended the line of Egyptian pharaohs with a beloved bang, as was her style. Number one, Ramses II. All right, this one was definitely the one I thought of first. Ramses II is arguably the most famous of all the pharaohs. He reigned for 67 years. He had 96 children. He had a crazy successful military campaign conquering the Hittites, Syrians, and Nubians. No other pharaoh that we know of has been able to build like he has. He lived to the age of 90, which is insane for back then. And he professed himself a god, which I'm sure some people actually believed. Even today, when we moved his remains to France for restoration, he had to be given a passport that literally said, King, deceased, under the occupation. Truly an incredibly influential pharaoh. Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine. Baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour, chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw in and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit, they train them to make beer, and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arm. So you know what? I get it. Get a Harambe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles, and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, depends. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens, like the one I mentioned before, concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if you got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so 
She looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack naked and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass. Honestly, just do your thing. Work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go, girl. You got this. You get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well, we can't, we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's, that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number five, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day, poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief. Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number three, till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well, if you were a servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered a very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. 
that's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about. Yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title Heretic King and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. 